Good evening. My name is Shin Yi Pai, and I'm the program director at Town Hall. On behalf of the staff at Town Hall Seattle and our friends at Elliott Bay Books, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's virtual presentation with Giulio Boccoletti. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution's stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish my people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all for tuning in online. Town Hall is proud to be a community focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, both here in the beautiful Town Hall space and virtually. Town Hall will continue to produce virtual content as we launch into this new season, including our weekly podcast in the moment, which features exclusive guests and many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form in our digital media library. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Other upcoming programs include Jeff Manon and Nicola Twilley and their new book on the past and future of quarantine, which will be at the same time next Tuesday. And during our next in-person and live stream event on September 20th, Rob Reich, Maran Sahami, and Jeremy M. Weinstein talk about where big tech went wrong and how to reboot it. Check our website or subscribe to our e-newsletter to get the latest updates as more programs are added throughout the season. If you share in Town Hall's vision for a robust community engaged in the arts, science, and culture where everyone has a voice, please consider supporting us tonight by donating or becoming a member. Visit our website for more info. But back to this evening's event. Tonight's presentation will be about one hour in length, including question and answer. To streamline our virtual audience experience, we've changed the Q&A platform for our events. To submit your question, please use your phone or computer to enter meet.ps backslash Boccoletti. We'll drop this link in the chat, and when we get to the Q&A portion, we'll remind folks again where to go. We can't guarantee that we'll be able to address every question, but we'll try to get as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. For those who would like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The program will be available for rewatching immediately following the event. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our science series is supported by Microsoft, the Norcliffe Foundation, the Neshulm Family Foundation, Caffin Foundation, and Wincoat Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching from home. Lastly, you'll want to dive deeper into this evening's topic by purchasing a copy of Dr. Boccoletti's book. Please use the link in the chat below to pick up your copy through Elliott Bay Books. Giulio Boccoletti is a physicist and climate scientist holding a doctorate from Princeton University, where he was a NASA Earth Systems Science Fellow. He is an honorary research associate at the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment at the University of Oxford. Water, an autobiography, is the subject of this evening's talk. Please join me in welcoming Giulio Boccoletti. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be uh, here with you tonight. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to be joining you from London. Um, it's uh, 2 a.m. right now, so I'll be uh, trying to keep the conversation lively despite the hour. Let me share my screen so that you can hopefully see my uh, presentation. There we go. Um, so I'll tell you some of the stories that have uh, come out of this uh, book that I've uh, written that is now out, Water Biography. And I thought I would start here because I'm talking to you. Uh, most of you, I assume, will be in Seattle. And uh, you will have observed that the summer has been quite unusual. We've seen uh, the west of the American continent go up in flames, as has Greece and Turkey and many parts of the world. At the same time, we've had the very significant uh, flooding events. We just had a week ago, uh, Storm Ida go through New York City. But of course, we also had the flooding events in, uh, in Germany and uh, in China over the course of the summer when the Rhine and the Yellow Rivers uh, flooded, burst their banks and, and, and flooded. And so it seems like something is, is going on. And indeed, there are two things here that are going on that I want to talk about tonight. The first, of course, is that the climate system appears to be changing. This is not news. And so it I seems like as a climate scientist uh, over 25 years ago, and you know, back then we already knew that this was uh, uh, going to happen. But it seems like the uh, nature uh, and statistics of uh, of climate events is changing. And of course, water is the way in which the climate system expresses its agency on the landscape. So the floods, the storms, and the droughts 
that we observe are simply the agents of the climate system, and uh, they seem to be gradually changing. And of course, the other thing that's happening is that the systems and infrastructure that we uh, put in place to protect us, to deliver security in the face of the variability of the climate system, seem to be failing. So uh, I believe, and this is why I wrote the book, that we can't really understand where we are today and what we ought to do in the future if we don't understand how we got here, how we got to this point. Um, and this is really the, the context for the book I wrote. And I would like to start this, uh, this evening's presentation by reading a couple of paragraphs uh, from the book, just to frame the, um, the argument uh, that, I'll be making, um, that I'll be making this, e this evening. So from the book, uh, the story of water is not technological, but political. The impact of water on society must be read through the scars left by a continuous cycle of adaptation. All communities relate to water over time through a process of action and reaction. A levee might protect people settled behind it. A dam might store water for those times when none comes from the sky. But as towns grow and farms expand, people forget why those structures were built in the first place. Society evolves and habituates to its newfound security. Institutions develop in the shadow of infrastructure designed to create an illusion of stability. Then, one day, unexpectedly, the levee fails or the reservoir behind the dam goes dry. Loss follows, sometimes catastrophically. People are forced to reconsider their environment, which is no longer the inert scenery to their life. They learn, rebuild, expand, reaching a new level of security. Their institutions adjust, habits change, the cycle repeats. Technological progress and people's emancipation from nature are a secondary theme in this story. The effects of humanity's ongoing relationship with water are not merely written in rivers. They are etched into the fabric of society, into the beliefs, behaviors, and systems that regulate everyday life. What is most engineered is not landscape, but political institutions. The central argument of this book is that humanity's attempts to organize society while surrounded by moving water led people to create institutions which tied individuals together in mutual dependence as they tried to deal with their, uh, with their environment. And so this really is the central thesis of the book. Um, and if institutions are the protagonists of the story, institutions are fundamentally about ideas and ideas have history. And so uh, the book is really a history of the relationship between uh, society and water. Tonight, I can't go through the whole argument of the book, but I'll give you a few vignettes, a few vignettes that will give you a sense of the type of argument that I'm making in this book. And I cannot but start from the very, very beginning. And the very beginning is far away, it's 3.8 billion years ago. That is when we think that water first appeared on the planet. Now, we don't know uh, how exactly it got on the planet. It might have been uh, that it degassed from the interior of the planet once it had cooled, and therefore that it came from the protostellar material that formed, uh, coalesced into the planet itself, or more likely uh, that it was de deposited on the planet by a series of asteroids that, uh, that, hit, uh, that hit the planet. This uh, second hypothesis seems to be the most likely based on the evidence today. Be that as it may, ever since the amount of water, this amount of water has been effectively fixed. Um, now, uh, the amount of water that's on the planet, you can see there in the bubble that coalesced there. Now, most of that today is actually in the oceans. Um, and so if you eliminate the oceans for a second and just ask yourself how much water, how much fresh water is on the planet, the sort of water that was involved in, in, in Ida, for example. Well, this is the amount of water, fresh water that is on the planet today that is not locked up in, in, in the oceans. But then again, you, you find, if you look at this more carefully, that about two thirds of that smaller bubble is locked up in ice, uh, the East and West Antarctic ice sheets and the Greenland ice sheet. And then about a third of it is in groundwater, much of which is inaccessible. So if you ask yourself how much water is there really that we consider sort of running water, the water that surrounds us, the water that is the agent of the climate system on any given day in any given place, well this is the amount of water that we essentially have. Um, you can see that, let me put a circle around it. So that is the water that is the cause of all these uh, problems. 
Now, it's not scarce in the sense that oil is scarce. It's not, uh, it's a renewable resource. The amount of water, as I said, is essentially fixed on the planet, but it's certainly finite. And given how little that amount of water is, its distribution in space and time matters a great deal. Now, you may take from this picture the idea that this is a fragile resource, something that we should be concerned about. But in truth, uh, quite the opposite is, is true. We have to be concerned about ourselves because even though it's a tiny amount of resource, um, it is involved in processes that have the power to overwhelm even the most technological society in history. Right? And I can show you this in many ways, but one way I can show you this is just by thinking about the energy cycle of the planet. So the sun shines about 170,000 terawatts of um, uh, power on the, on the planet. Just to give you a sense of scale, the entire world economy operates on about 13 terawatts. That's all the energy that we use to power buildings and transport and industry and, and, and the like. Most of the energy that comes down from the sun is intercepted by water which then evaporates, carrying with its latent heat into the atmosphere. Then water condensates again down, precipitates as rain, and releases that heat. Now, that hydrological cycle involves about 4,000 billion cubic meters of water uh, per week. And then, the, again, the number is not terribly important, but if you compare it to the amount of water that's involved in human processes, for example, the amount of water that we use to irrigate all of our fields and produce all of the food on the planet for 7 billion people, uh, you realize that that's only about 77 billion cubic meters uh, uh, of water per week. So in other words, the processes that water is involved in on the planet simply dwarf even the most powerful activities that, uh, that humanity is engaged in. So this agent of the climate system is a truly powerful agent. And so it is not surprising that from the earliest moments of human civilization, it was an important counterpart, an important agent that we had to deal with. Now, if we turn to the story of how did we show up in the middle of this, uh, this particular story, well, you can look at the last five million years. That's when the first hominids uh, appeared. And as you can see from this graph, this is a graph of temperature on the planet. Uh, it's a proxy for global surface temperature. And the temperatures were sort of decreasing. And as they decrease, these oscillations that you see in this graph are the symptom of ice ages, particularly towards the end of the graph, or towards uh, 1 million years ago. We started having these massive ice ages, which were essentially large-scale transformations of the water distribution on the planet. Uh, at the peak of our ice age, you'd have most of the northern hemisphere covered in ice. Uh, in the troughs, you'd have uh, virtually none, right? Now, hominids were around for much of this time, but Homo sapiens wasn't. Uh, we really only appeared about 300,000 uh, years ago. And for that, for most of that time, for most of the 300,000 years, we were essentially hunter-gatherers. We were nomads who would adapt to the environmental conditions by moving. Uh, we were essentially takers of the conditions provided by nature. And then 10,000 years ago, something changed. Uh, we became sedentary. And in fact, it is only in the last 10,000 years uh, that little, little sliver at the very right-hand side, that we have any evidence of what today we would consider culture beyond uh, mere existence. And so writing and art and complex civilizations and the likes. So 10,000 years ago is really when we decided to stand still in a world of moving water. And that is really when the origin of our relationship with water, uh, with water started. So it shouldn't be surprising that if you look at the evidence from the early civilizations, you find that water is central to the life of complex societies and life of people. One way to see this, many stories I could choose, but is to look at this artifact. So this is a tablet from the Royal Library of Ashurbanipal in Nineveh. It was collected in the middle of the 19th century in modern day, modern day Iraq. And it's an artifact of the seventh century. So it's a new Babylonian artifact, but it actually replicates um, an image and, uh, and uh, text that probably dates far further back in time possibly the pre-dynastic period, maybe even to the early Sumerian period of Uruk. And so we're talking about two or three millennia before common era. Now, what's interesting about this, uh, uh, this tablet are two things. First of all, the map at the bottom, that's the first map we've uh, got of the world. It's the first representation of, uh, of the world, the Babylonian map of the world. And water is at the heart of uh, its representation. So you can see it here, I'll illustrate it for you. At the very heart of the map, you can see the Euphrates River. And then there in the middle, you see the uh, city of Babylon. 
And then on the bottom right, you can see the Mesopotamian marshes. Uh, and then on the bottom left, you have the Shat al-Arab, the canal that connects the Persian Gulf to uh, the Euphrates. So an unfired clay, a few etched marks, the whole world represented and water is right at the heart of this, um, of this representation of the world. But there's another reason why this tablet is interesting. In the cuneiform writing above and behind it, it refers to characters from a very ancient story, the story of Utnapishtim. Now Utnapishtim was a patriarch a um, Mesopotamian patriarch. Um, we know of him from the Epic of Gilgamesh. And the story goes that Utnapishtim was told by a god to build a boat and put all of his animals on it. And then the gods unleashed a massive deluge, a massive flood that covered all the land. And Utnapishtim um, floated in this boat for days and days and days and nights and nights and nights until he sent out a dove uh, to find land, and the dove eventually came back uh, with a small branch, small olive branch in its uh, beak, uh, showing that he had found land. Uh, Utnapishtim eventually landed on the top of Mount Urartu, the flood drained away, and life began again. Now, that story, which some of you might have recognized, uh, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, as the story of Noah, actually predates uh, the writing of the Old Testament by about a thousand or fifteen hundred years, and uh, it's a testament to the to a fact that I've encountered as I was writing this book, which is most civilizations have at the origin uh, of their story, their origin story, their origin myth is often planted firmly in water, and so it's not just the story of Napishtim or of Noah. But you have the story of the Unupachakuti flood in the Inca tradition, the Lenape, the original inhabitants of Manhattan, Manhattan um, believed they descended from people that had survived a great flood, or indeed the story of the Jade Emperor, uh, Lord of Heaven in China and the creation of the four, uh, the four rivers. So all civilizations have stories planted firmly in water, uh, showing that our origin as sedentary societies is really about our relationship with water. Now, in the book, I spend a lot of time uh, talking about the canon of uh, stories from antiquity and the various forms of abstraction that uh, arose from the different civilizations. I don't have time to do that tonight, but I wanted to draw your attention on one particular story, which is particularly important for the argument that I'm trying to pursue. And this is shown here, I now fast forward to 6th uh, century Greece. This is a, a vase, an attic vase, showing a group of hoplites. Now, hoplites uh, were the uh, heavily armored infantrymen that made up the Greek phalanx, arguably the most powerful fighting unit in antiquity, from stories of Thucydides and others. Um, but hoplites were also farmers, and they were farmers who cultivated small patches of land uh, that were primarily rain-fed. Now, those patches of lands were very productive, so much so that these hoplites could afford to buy the heavy armor and the weapons that they needed to participate in the phalanx. The story of Greece, of classical Greece, is an extraordinary story of these individuals who, because of their military importance, were able to demand political agency. And famously, Greece went through a process of constitutional transformation, first through the cons famous constitution of Sparta, and then, of course, through the democratic uh, experiments in Athens, first in, with Solon and then with uh, Cleisthenes. Uh, and what's interesting for the story of water is that this uh, transformation in political institutions comes about because of the importance and the, mean, the need for political agency of these hoplites. And these hoplites are powerful politically and militarily because they depend on rain-fed agriculture, which allows them to essentially manage their own water independently of each other. In Greece, farmers didn't have to work together to manage a powerful river. They all benefited from essentially the water that came down from the sky. So it's not me surprising that the political form that took place in, in Greece is one that emphasized the political agency of the individual. And this is a very important theme uh, all, through, uh, all through the book. Now, those experiments, to cut a very, very long story short, were then metabolized in the context of the schools of political philosophy, like those of Aristotle, by historians like Polybius, and ended up feeding the most important Republican uh, experiment in human history, the longest lasting, which is the Roman Republic, of course, uh, 
And the Roman Republic is in many ways the prototype of the Republic, a political institution that mediates between the individuals who have political agency, largely because they are individual producers, and uh, the Commonwealth, the benefit, the collective action that pursues a common benefit, right? And this is an important story. I can't get into a lot of detail today, but it's just to say that the the story of the Roman Republic becomes incredibly important in the creation of modern uh, of modern institutions. The question is, why did these institutions that formed in the Mediterranean in a particular type of hydrology and with a particular type of water environment, why did they come to dominate uh, the entire world? At this very time, we had neo uh, pre-classical Mayan civilizations in, in, uh, in uh, Central America, and of course we had the Qin uh, dynasty creating the unification of China. So there's no reason to believe that this was going to be a particularly dominant uh, political form. But of course, over the subsequent 1500 years, the process of colonization and, and of expansion of the European state ended up exporting this institution all across the world. And with it, the DNA of that original relationship with water that those societies developed in the Mediterranean. Again, the book goes into some detail on this process. I can only give you a couple of vignettes, but I thought one of them that's interesting and germane to, to the conversation and, and that I feel quite close to is the story of Bologna, uh, which I think exemplifies a bit this process. Now, Bologna happens to be the city in Italy where I'm from. Uh, it's a city in the heart of Northern Italy. It's landlocked, uh, as you can see, from where the arrow is pointing. It had its heyday in the late Middle Ages, so the 11th to 15th uh, centuries. And if you look at it from above, Bologna doesn't look like a water city at all. It's landlocked, you don't see much of a trace of a river. It has its well, traditional Lombard structure. But if you walk along the, uh, the roads of Bologna and you look behind the walls and behind the windows, you can see still the traces, as I did here in this video, I took a while ago, a few months ago, of the canals that in the Middle Ages innovated the entire, the entire city. And indeed, the structure of this medieval city was entirely innovated by, uh, by canals, right? Why? Because water in the Middle Ages was essentially the fuel of the economy. And this is a very important political and economic point. How did it work? Well, here's how it worked in Bologna, at least. Uh, these canals fed water into ducts that went into the basements of buildings. You can see a cross section of a building there on the right. And buildings had, had mills, in this case, silk mills, um, that would be powered by the water wheels that sat in the basement. These mills could be two or three stories high and they could produce, four, they would have up to 4,000 bobbins swirling around and producing thread, silk thread or hemp thread or other threads that would go into textile production and then would get exported across, uh, across all of Europe. And in fact, this is a little model of the of the silk mill that was reproduced for the uh, Museum of Industry in Bologna. And you can see this was mechanization powered by water 600 years before uh, the invention of the steam engine. It was a proto-industrialization. And so water in the Middle Ages was a fundamental ingredient to, to the economy at a time when the only other source of energy was essentially muscle uh, energy or animal or animal um, power. Now, it was economically important, but something else happened in Bologna that's quite important to this story. So let me spend a number of minutes on, on this city. Um, in Bologna in 1088, the first university uh, in the modern Western world was founded. Now, one of the things that happened very early in the process of founding university was that a particularly important document uh, rose, came out of the darkness of history once again. And that was the Corpus Juris Civilis, the Justinian Code. The Justinian Code was the synthesis of the Roman law. And it had first been issued in the sixth century. Uh, we then sort of lost track of it. There's a letter from St. Gregory that talks about it in the seventh century, and then that's it, uh, the dark. And then it emerges again in Bologna uh, around the, the second half of the 11th century, uh, recovering a system, a legal system of uh, an, an lucidity and coherence that was, had been forgotten in, in much of Europe. And because water was such an important uh, contributor to the economy of a medieval city, it's inevitable that an enormous amount of jurisprudence developed on the topic of water. 
And then what happened was that teachers like Ernerius, Ernerius was a famous professor at the University of Bologna, so famous in legal scholarship that he was called Lucerna Juris, the lantern of law, ended up training an entire generation of jurists that spread all across Europe, bringing this legal system with them and homogenizing legal approaches across, uh, um, across Europe. And in the process, bringing this Roman institution, which contained the DNA of that original relationship with water, that particular relationship with water, all across Europe, even in England, where I'm uh, calling in from today. In fact, the first teacher of uh, law in Oxford was Vacarius, who studied in uh, Bologna, as did, by the way, Thomas Beck, for example, and who were instrumental in the definition of, for example, the Magna Carta. And so it's not surprising that in the Magna Carta, you actually find not just traces of Roman law, but traces of Roman law that speaks about water. Article 33, for example, of the Magna Carta is specifically about the management uh, of the Thames. So the process that started in the Middle Ages was essentially this process of recovery of ancient institutions that had been developed in a particular hydrology during the Greek and Roman world, and that started spreading and, 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 and evolving uh, in, the late, uh, in the late Middle Ages. Another character of great importance to the story, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail about him, but is Bartos the Saxoferratus. He was a jurist from Central Italy who essentially developed the modern uh, notion of territorial sovereignty. And again, that happened on the back of uh, his studies of the impact of rivers on landscapes. The question was, if a river meanders and creates new land, who owns it? And from that observation, he introduced the modern idea of sovereignty. And then, of course, Niccolò Machiavelli, who picked out of the uh, of the darkness of history, once again, with the aid, of course, of Byzantine scholars and Arab scholars, um, the modern idea of republic, the, the republican principles that had emerged through his discourses on Livy, that had emerged out of the Roman tradition, and he reintroduces them in the story, in the story of Europe. Okay, now, to get a sense of how all of these layers of history ended up then uh, propagating through time in the European tradition. One visual way of doing that is to look at this monument. Now, this is a picture I took uh, just a year ago in Rome, and it's a monument that's called the Fontana dei Quattro Fiumi, the Fountain of the Four Rivers, and it was commissioned to Lorenzo Bernini in uh, 1651 by Pope Innocent X, and the monument was supposed to celebrate the end the peace, the end of the religious wars that had plagued the first part of the 17th century. And it was also a way of reestablishing the universality of the papacy in a context in which that universality had all but eroded in a world that was amply globalized. And this uh, monument, which had such uh, kind of a political value is, uh, pun intended, literally dripping with water in, uh, in its uh, symbolism. So, for example, at the very top of this monument, we're now in the 17th century, you see the dove with the olive branch. Now, the dove was the symbol of the Pamphili family, the family of Innocent X, and it's since become a universal symbol of peace because of this monument. But in the time, it was a direct reference to the deluge, the story that I, I just uh, started from. And then, of course, you have the uh, obelisk, the obelisk uh, which represented power because it referred back to the Egyptian civilization, which still in the 17th century, the great river civilization was thought of as a symbol of universal and perennial power. The obelisk was uh, made of uh, Aswan granite and then was brought to Rome actually by Emperor Domitian, who had it in, his, in one of his palaces until it was put on this uh, monument by Bernini. And then, of course, Bernini designs four great gods representing the four great rivers, the Ganges the Rio Plata, the Danube, and the Nile, which were the four rivers of a globalizing world. You know, at the time, silver was coming from America, from the Rio del Plata, the Ganges, the spices from the east, the Nile with its unknown sources, and the Danube, the great river of Europe. So this is a globalizing world. And I, I will draw your attention to the fact that the, the value of water, the importance of water to this monument is identical to the important centrality of water that I showed you in that tablet that represented a worldview that dates from around 2,000 years before this, uh, if, not, if not more. Now, the 17th century 
this idea of water and these institutions that had emerged from antiquity went on to seed the truly modern institutions. And they were all institutions that had water in their DNA, but were also arising from the relationship of 17th century society with water. And so, for example, you have the Dutch polders, which become the basis of a, a demo, sort of democratic process, not really, but it was a, a sort of distributed process that leads then to the uh, Dutch Republic and to the Lord States General. Uh, you have, of course, the, uh, the great utopian writers, Thomas More, uh, Tommaso Campanella and others who wrestle with the political implications for the idea of a republic of the encounter with the new world and its particular uh, hydrology. You have, of course, the drying of the fens in Lincolnshire in England, um, underwritten in part by Charles I, who then eventually, uh, also because of this, lost his head in the Commonwealth, the first and only Republican experience uh, in English history. And then, of course, the Treaty of Westphalia, which is the origin of the architecture of international relations today. And those treaties were in large part about the management of the European rivers over which the wars had been uh, fought. For example, the Treaty of Munster, which is between the Lord States General in the Netherlands and the Crown and the Spanish Crown, the Treaty of Munster is in, in some part about the sharing of the Schelt River, the river that connects Antwerp um, to the sea. Now, these were institutions, these were the institutions that went through the process of colonization and through uh, imperialism that's, that uh, followed them, then got distributed across the world and they brought with them this DNA of this relationship, fundamental relationship with water that had developed in the Mediterranean uh, basin. Now, the book spends a fair amount of time talking about that process. I've put here the picture of the frontispiece of the Leviathan, Hobbes' uh, masterpiece, because in truth, this is about how water contributed to the construction of the modern sovereign state. And there's a long conversation that we could have about that. But I wanted to highlight one point here, and I, I put the American Constitution here, just to make the case that uh, the institutions of modernity, including the model republic, America was and is the model republic, Public are really firmly planted also in water. The uh, Philadelphia Convention that produced this constitution is the terminus of a process that started uh, with the Mount Vernon Compact, the, 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 the compact that happened at the estate that George Washington had in Virginia. And that compact was really about the management of trade, of commerce, on the fluvial waterways of the newly formed uh, nation, and on interstate trade in particular, the Potomac in particular in that case. Um, at the time, the states were governed, before the Constitution, they were governed by the Articles of Confederation, which is sort of a monument to libertarianism that had no provisions for a federal government and a federal power. It wasn't really a republic. And so the Constitution establishes the, the republican form uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the American state, and its origins, once again, are in the waters of the landscape. And if you read the debates that happened during the convention, you can see that the example of the Mount Vernon Compact comes up uh, again and again. Now, the story uh, is far more complex than this, of course, and I don't have time to uh, going into detail, but I hope you'll you'll you look the, you'll look up the book and 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 read it. I, I found it fascinating as I was researching to write it. I want to get to the last part of the story because it's important to understand. Uh, it, it's crucial in order to understand how we got to the problems that I started from, the floods in Germany, in Ida, and so forth and so on. Uh, and for that, we have to talk about the 20th century, the hydraulic century. And in that century, the American Republic played a disproportionate role. Um, I can give you only one example tonight, but I wanted to focus on the story of the Tennessee River as the sort of example of how the American Republic ended up playing this disproportionate role in the story of water uh, in, the, in the world. So the Tennessee is a tributary of the Ohio River, which then flows into the Mississippi. At the beginning of the century, it was largely non-navigable and the watershed was heavily degraded. People living in the Tennessee lived for the most part in abject poverty. You had malnutrition, pellagra, silicosis, heart disease, um, and most of the watershed was, uh, was heavily, heavily degraded. When the, uh, when the Great Depression happened and uh, Roosevelt came into power, 
uh, within the first 100 days of his uh, government, you know, this is the government of Francis Perkins and others, he established, uh, he promoted the TVA Act and established the Tennessee Valley Authority. Now, the thesis here was very specific. Roosevelt had promised during the campaigns that he would establish four federally funded utilities in the four corners of the country. So in the Tennessee, in the St. Lawrence River, in the Columbia and in the Colorado, in order to break the monopoly on power production of private producers. The reason for this was that the power costs were too high for the rural people like those that lived in Tennessee to access. Because at the time, the only scalable technology for the production of electricity was hydropower. And because there wasn't much in terms of high voltage transmission yet, that will happen only after the Second World War, uh, rivers were really the blueprint of industrialization. And so the idea of developing these utilities on these big rivers was really the way in which the federal government could promote development, right? Uh, so they started with the Tennessee Valley, but the TVA was much more than a utility. It was really a development agency. Uh, and it was a development agency that Roosevelt described as a corporation clothed with the power of government, but possessed of the flexibility and initiative of private enterprise. And it was even more than a development agency. In fact, one of its first leaders, David Lilenthal, who was one of the first directors and became eventually the chairman, wrote a book called TVA, Democracy on the March, which is really a political pamphlet that reflects on how this is really a process of enfranchisement for the people that live in the system served by the TVA. Now, regardless of what you think about the the sort of nature of this argument. This was the quintessential American modernist project, the idea that you could create an institution, a political institution that was based on the management of a river and could deliver political agency to people through the re-engineering of the landscape, right? It's an extraordinary thought. Um, it was particularly, it was successful in developing the Tennessee Valley, but it was also seen in the sort of complex system of checks and balances of the United States as a massive case of federal overreach. So Roosevelt was never able to replicate the Tennessee Valley Authority anywhere in the United States. But the, the project and the, the, the idea was so compelling that it had enormous success abroad. And so when Truman came to power and he turned technical assistance into an instrument of diplomacy, uh, Tennessee Valley Authority like projects started popping up all over the world. And so we ended up with the Jordan Valley Authority and the Helmand Valley Authority in Afghanistan and the Awash Valley Authority in, um, in Ethiopia. And uh, the Indus was thought as a Valley Authority. Jean Monnet, the founder of Europe, thought of the Marshall Plan in Europe as a TVA of Europe. And even the Yangtze was contemplated as a TVA, as a and a valley authority. And that process of taking that institution that was rooted in water and distributing it across the world had a profound impact on the water landscape of the world. This is a graph from work that uh, Peter uh, Glick uh, pulled together a few years ago, and it shows over time the increase in reservoir storage in the world. You see that at the beginning of the 20th century, we almost had none. The largest dam in 1904 was the Aswan Dam, Lower Aswan Dam, which was a mainstream dam that the Brits had built in the Egyptian protectorate. By the time you get to 1980, by the time things like the TVA and Hoover Dam have spread across the world, we've gotten to the point where we can catch a fifth of anything that comes down from the sky. We have entirely replumbed the planet, particularly in developed countries, giving people the illusion that nature's been controlled. And that is the illusion that was broken by the events of the last few months and indeed by events in the last few years. Now, the story doesn't end here. Uh, many living in Europe and America thought that the age of large scape uh, landscape uh, transformation and infrastructure building was over in the 1780s. In reality, its focus simply shifted. And so I want to end by telling you one last very brief story, which is what happened on the other side of the world in China. So in China in 2009, at the beginning of the 21st century, uh, the Chinese government built Three Gorges Dam, the largest dam on the planet, on the Yangtze. It's 28 million cubic meters of concrete that hold back a reservoir that's 600 kilometers long. This piece of infrastructure is enormous. I've been several times. It's uh, you know, 10 times the installed capacity in hydropower of Hoover Dam. And it's a dam that's supposed to also protect people downstream from, uh, from floods. Now, this wasn't just a 
piece of infrastructure, though. It was an act of sovereignty of the People's Republic of China. And in fact, the cost of that act of sovereignty were enormous. Flooded artifacts in history, 1.5 million people were displaced in the process, and the ecosystems of the Yangtze were transformed completely. But this was the beginning of implementation of a new modernist project. And in fact, the Chinese built not just Three Gorges Dam, but started building dams all the way up the mid-stem of the Yangtze, Jilodu, Zhangjiba, all these dams that eventually turned the Yangtze from a river into a canal. And now, of course, they're exporting this all over the world, just like the Americans did in the 20th century. And so this is work that I did while I was at the Nature Conservancy some years ago with Jeff Oppen and Opperman and others. This is a map that shows dams under construction or planned. And you can see that while Europe and, uh, and, uh, and America mostly have existing dams and a few that are being constructed or planned, places like Africa, most of their infrastructures are ahead. And in fact, some estimate that over the next 20 to 30 years, the world will build as much water infrastructure and as much hydropower as it did over the last 100 years. So I want to end this kind of very quick and sweeping uh, story of water with, um, with just a short reading of two paragraphs, just to close the story, to try and impress on you this idea that the story of water matters, and it shows that really the crux of the story is in the political institutions, uh, and in particularly in the relationship of people with the state. And so let me just read you these last short paragraphs. As the climate system evolves in response to changes in the chemistry of the atmosphere, it will challenge engineered and institutional solutions in unprecedented ways. The fractures that may appear will test the robustness of society's adaptation. Catastrophes are powerful sources of political energy, which can easily lend themselves as much to the next step in nation building as they can to oppression. The ideal Republican state served society by intermediating collective resources in the service, broadly speaking, of the common good. But it has always been unstable. The authoritarian state that may take its place, or the imperialist state abroad, used society's struggle with nature as an instrument of control. When the struggles with water break through the surface, wherever the walls of institutions and infrastructure are thinnest, the destruction of communities, the forced migration of a people fleeing drought, the displacement of others to make room for infrastructure, all can destroy the carefully constructed illusion that holds up the authority of the state on the landscape. The impacts of climate change on water will travel not via the rivers and floodplains of the world, but through the institutions of human society. Today, more than ever, society is bound by its expectations of water security. What will happen when a society anywhere in the world cannot or will not meet those expectations will shape everyone's future on the planet. Uh, and with that, thank you very much for listening, and um, I'll be happy to take um, any questions that you guys have. Julio, thank you so much for that intriguing presentation. I learned many new things tonight, which is very exciting. And Good. yeah, now we're going to segue to some questions from the audience. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Faith, and I am the town ma I'm the house manager at Town Hall. So our first question tonight is, when did you know you wanted to write this book and what were your biggest hurdles in the first steps? Um, so this book has been a long time coming. I, you know, I've been reflecting on these issues for the last at least decade. Um, the moment I decided to write the book is actually a very personal one. I, the person that mentored me in uh, these water issues, a fellow by the name of John Briscoe, who was a professor at Harvard um, and used to run the water programs at the World Bank for many years, passed away in 2014, at the end of 2014. And um, a couple of weeks after, I opened a file on my computer and I titled it Water Book and I started writing. And uh, in a way, this was a way of continuing conversations that I so enjoyed and I had with him over the years. And so that's what, what's when I decided to start. But I also came to realize in working on water issues for a number of years that th there is a danger in thinking that water issues, in fact, environmental issues writ large, that they are sort of ahistorical technological issues. 
And I think that in truth, most of these issues are about what we want the landscape to look like and what our values are. These are deeply political issues. And in order for people to be equipped with the language to debate and discuss these political issues, I believe they have to access, have access to where these ideas came from and how they relate to the rest of the sort of philosophy by which people live. And so that was really the motivation. The biggest hurdle, frankly, was to make it uh, succinct enough to fit in a in a readable book. At one point, I had the alarming number of 600,000 words written down. And uh, uh, worry not, this is not a 600,000 word <laughs> volume. You can you can read it easily in a few days. It's, it's less than 100,000 words. But it was just making choices about what stories to tell. That was really the biggest, uh, the biggest hurdle. Yeah. So when you wrote Water Book, did you know right then and there that you had enough to talk about within this novel? Oh, well, I, you know, the, the story of water is so pervasive. I mean, if you, you know, if you work in water issues in particular, you then sort of catch what you might call a water bug, which means that you look around and everywhere you see the place uh, everywhere you see the impact of our relationship with water. And so I have, you know, it's a, it's a pervasive issue. In fact, for most of the history of humanity, it was the issue for most people. It wouldn't have been surprising 150 years ago that somebody would want to write a book on water because it was a fact of life for most people all the time. You know, that you and I, I presume, don't have to wade a stream on our way to work is a very unusual situation that's only been the case for the last you know, 50, 60 years. Mm. As I have no doubt there will be enough to, uh, enough to talk about. Oh, great. That's well, wonderful. Um, our next question, which I'm very excited to hear your answer is, could our society today work with a predominantly water economy? Why or why not? Well, 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 that's a great uh, question. Um, you know, we are an energy society. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about uh, the life of a farmer, and you compare the life of a farmer in 1900 to, in, to the year 2000, mm -hmm. in 1900, the life of a farmer would not have been that different from the life of a farmer in the 12th century. 90% of the energy that those farmers had access to in 1900 would have been animal energy and, uh, and, and therefore food, calories from food, and their own efforts, right? And then they had a little bit of fuel wood for heating their, uh, their homes and, and, um, and, and cooking their food. Now, fast forward to your average farmer in Iowa, and they will be sitting on a tractor that's likely uh, that's likely air conditioned. And of the energy that's expended in producing that food, only 5% is human or muscle energy. The rest of it is energy that, you know, alas, comes from fossil fuels or from electricity or from other sources. So we have essentially, for every person living on the planet, we have dozens of energy slaves that are essentially working on our behalf. There isn't enough uh, energy in the distribution of water, just the potential energy of water is not enough to cover all of that. So we can't be an energy society, in, a water society in that sense. Mm. But if we transition to a fully renewable uh, energy uh, platform, then water will play a far more important uh, role. Uh, in all sorts of complicated ways from directly from the modifications that come in the landscape by planting wind farms or solar plants or indeed using hydropower um, all the way to the role that water has in the processing of the minerals that are required to actually make those renewable energies work uh, and so in a sense uh, we, we, we will be and in some ways we still are very much a water you know a water society I mean last thing I'll say on this Faith uh, is yeah. that um, you know, even the fossil fuel economy that we have today, remember that the fundamental vector for that energy is water, right? The Ooh. boilers that burn the coal or the fuel uh, are, are heating up water, which then goes through the turbines. So we're still very much a water economy in that sense, at least. In that sense, yes. Maybe not the obvious canals and the streams That's and right. on board via boat, but still in many ways that we don't really consider today. Yeah. So our next question is, what specific water catastrophes do you foresee in the future? How much time do we have left and what solutions do you know of to deal with them? So this is a really important question because yeah. there's, a, there's a risk that when people think about water, they picture uh, sort of the equivalent of a peak oil story of a 
we are going to run out of water, we're going to run out of the substance, and, and then people will start fighting over it. And that simply isn't the story of water. As I said at the beginning, the amount of water on the planet is fixed and keeps getting recycled. That doesn't mean that there won't be catastrophes, but it's important to recognize that the origin of those catastrophes is and will be entirely human. So the issue is that the climate system changes all the time. Um, let's talk about the West of the United States, for example. When John Wesley Powell visited the West of the United States in the 19th century, it wasn't habitable in the sense of a European society. Of course, it was, it was entirely lived in, but it wasn't habitable in the sense of Western European agriculture, right? And so Powell suggested that there would be the need for significant investments of the federal government in order to transform the landscape. And those investments did indeed happen with the progressive era and onwards, the big dams, Hoover Dam, the canals, the American canals, all this infrastructure turned a completely arid desert landscape into the Garden of America, so much so that California exports uh, or to the rest of the United States all of its produce and crops, right? That is a human-made landscape. It well, is there because we've invested all this infrastructure uh, to make it happen that way. Now, it turns out that that infrastructure and that solution is reaching its limit. The story of water over 10,000 years is always a cycle of adaptation, failure, adaptation, failure. It's always kind of this process of it's this fashion bargain that we can't get out of, right? right? And so whether or not those failures are catastrophes, whether or not you have you know, catastrophes, which might be catastrophes for some in California, it could be the farmers who no longer have livelihood. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, the fact that some cities end up being depopulated. Those are catastrophes of design. They're, cata they're political catastrophes, right? Yeah. And in fact, the catastrophes that happen in water always befall on the most vulnerable. Mm. Right. So it's never Dubai exists. If you have money, you can almost solve any problem. But the problem is at what cost and who pays. And so the solutions um, to the potential catastrophes uh, linked to water are political solutions. They're solutions of enfranchisement, they're solutions of justice, they're solutions of distribution, they're solutions of ensuring that the most vulnerable don't become an accidental instrument of the climate system in causing a, a broader crisis. Um, I'll just give you one last example on this yeah, point. Uh, you know, one of the arc, one of the stories they talk about in the book is the collapse of the uh, Bronze Age societies of the Mediterranean. It's a sort of interesting model for modernity in a way. You know, there was a time we're talking about. Uh, you know. 1200 BCE, so it's a long time ago. Time, you, had, yeah. you, you had a globalized system of trade all across the Mediterranean and all across Europe. The people will have heard of the Hittites and the Mycenaeans and the Egyptians and so on. And within the span of less than a couple of years, most of that system came crumbling down. Now, if you ask yourself, why did that happen? We know that that collapse, and it was literally a collapse. I mean, the Greek world into dark ages, uh, that it only emerged, uh, you know, uh, four centuries later, the proximate cause for that collapse appears to have been a change in climate that caused a drying and a cooling of the Mediterranean. But that wasn't the direct reason for the collapse of the Hittites or of Ugarit or the problems of Egypt. What happened was the most vulnerable, which in this case were pastoralists who lived in the northern Balkans, could no longer live and sustain themselves in that landscape because of the changing climate. And so they started moving and they started moving down towards the Anatolian Peninsula and then eventually uh, through to North Africa. They were then subsequently named the Sea People and this is the invasion of the Sea People that brought down the Bronze Age world. So that's an example of how, you know, it was a water crisis, it was a change in climate system that expressed itself through a change in rainfall, but the actual uh, catastrophic event was a very human one, which incidentally should be a cause of optimism because anything we cause can also be solved by ourselves. And so I think that's yeah. partly why I find the, the history of water so interesting because you can find inspiration for solutions along all those 10,000 years. Right, there's gotta be something we can pull from that's worked in the past, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So our next question, which I would love to know the answer to, is why are we so willing to pollute water? Well, 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 that's a great Big question. question. Um, <laughs> you know, well, for, for a couple of things, I mean, 
uh, in part because as we industrialize, this is long-standing problem, by the way, the problem started uh, in the 19th century. Uh, as we industrialized and concentrated people in cities, um, we sort of separated the experience of most people with the landscape. Right? So most people were living in these cities and, and so they weren't really exposed to the conditions, the environmental conditions. Um, right. And and again, you know, it's one of those stories which is has a distributional aspect to it because we're willing to pollute because it's typically the most vulnerable that are then exposed to the consequences of that pollution. Right. Um, and so again, you know, it, it's another testament to the to political nature of water problems. To give you an analogy, you know, in the middle of the uh, 19th century, in the 1850s, London, where I'm calling from today, uh, you know, had become such a large city. Uh, it's as, it was as large then as this day. It was, uh, you know, 8 million people that uh, the sewers stopped working. They were massively underdimensioned and the rivers and canals were essentially, um, you know, uh, open sewers, right? Oh, wow. and, and that led to famous uh, uh, cholera, epidemics that killed uh, a lot of people, mostly, not exclusively, but mostly the poor that lived in the slums oh. that were uh, subjected to, to these problems. Oh. Um, and, you know, they had these, uh, most of these people had very limited political agency, but with the small fraction of political agency that they did have, they managed to bring to the attention of the government these issues. And eventually what happened was that the governments started looking for sources of Yes, and, uh, apologies, I must have had a, a little glitch here. That's all right, Josh, are we all good to go? I, I think I was talking about London and I, I may have been, uh, uh, you know, London may have reacted by cutting my Wi-Fi. So apologies, <laughs> apologies for that. Stop. <laughs> uh, that's right. Um, but my point is that the this issue of polluting rivers and why we do it, we do it because nobody pays for it, or those who pay for it have limited political agency. And the solution to that is in part technological. I mean, there are solutions to most pollution problems. They're a matter of expense, uh, mm -hmm. but the real underlying, the root cause and the root solution lies in the institutions and the political institutions that give agency to those who suffer the consequences. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I think we have time for about one more question, and it is this. What is the most unexpected thing you've encountered while writing slash researching this topic? Um, well, there were many, but one that's interesting and that I talk about a little bit in the book is the, the fact that in the last 15, 20 years, evidence has emerged of how uh, forest civilizations, so the populations that lived in the Amazon before the invasion of the Spanish, mm -hmm. managed their water environment. For a long time, people thought the Amazon was not populated. In reality, before Europeans brought uh, diseases and, and various other things, there were actually millions of people living in the forests of uh, Central and South America. And they had developed over time a remarkably different relationship with the landscape than the one that we developed in Europe. Um, and in fact, they developed a, uh, um, a, essentially they developed a system whereby they 
they domesticated the landscape. Now, Europeans and Near East populations domesticated individual species, but they domesticated the entire landscape. So the entire landscape became an organism in support of society. And so there are still today, you can find, you can see them from satellites, uh, mounds that they built to manage the floodwaters of the river so that they could harness the fisheries of the very productive fishes of the of the river and then they would build, they would grow fruit trees on top of those mounds and create an integrated landscape that was embedded in the forest, oh. but that uh, that could support a, what you might prefer to an urbanized society, not urbanized in the sort of London sense, but it was a densely populated society. And so, you know, that was a really interesting discovery, courtesy of the sort of recent archaeology of Latin America, um, and one that demonstrated that the story of water as we see it today, which is homogeneous across the world, water is managed yeah. exactly the same way, whether you're in Japan or you're in uh, Seattle, uh, didn't need to be that way, right? Over the course of human history, there's been enormous diversity of solutions. Uh, different ways of managing our relationship with uh, with water, which again is cause for hope because I think it expands the boundaries of what we can imagine our future might be. Yes. Wow. Wonderful. You ended that so so beautifully. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight to our viewers at home. Thank you for tuning in. And remember to buy a copy of the book from our partner bookseller company, Elliot Bay, and that link can be found in the chat. Julio, once again, thank you so much for being here. And I had a great time with you and I hope you have a good night and everyone have a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank Pleasure. you.